I am an artist living in beautiful Vermont, USA, and I have a lot of questions. So I engage the minds of the people that I meet, poets, writers, artists. I explore what's inside and share it with you. My name is Ricky McEachern, and I am eager to know. This episode's guest is a visual artist, writer, printmaker, calligrapher, community organizer, and activist. Candace Jensen is consistently engaged in numerous diverse creative endeavors, most of these being highly collaborative. Candace and partner have founded in situ Polyculture Commons, an arts residency located right here in southeastern Vermont. Here they champion the meaningful intersection of creativity and ecology. In May of 2022, Candace curated and exhibited Recalling the Chimera in New York's Amos Eno Gallery. Along with two fellow artists, they are putting together a monograph featuring full-color images of the more than 136 individual works in the show, with accompanying essays, poems, reference excerpts, and more. They will be self-publishing the monograph in a glorious and wondrous way. Candace also serves as letterpress and books art director for the Vermont-based poetry organization, The Ruth Stonehouse, right here in Goshen, Vermont. They have produced hand letterpress broadsides for poets near and far, and last fall, Poetry and Imagery of the Broadsides was published in the independent poetry journal, Iterant Mag, for which Candace is art editor. They also run very fun events in the summer and fall, and in 2023, they have all sorts of classes and retreats in the work. I was very curious to find out how someone with all of this going on can stay moving, engaged, and continuously, creatively activated. I am happy to present my conversation with Candace Jensen. I am here with Candace Jensen, who is artist, poet, calligrapher. What other, what other titles? Lots of do other we... titles. Um, arts advocate, curator, organizer, all right. polymath. Well, welcome, and thank you for being a guest on Eager to Know. I very much appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me today. So we obviously did like a pre-interview, and I did, you know, looked at your, um, you know, website. And the reason why I wanted to start with that intro is you have a lot going on. You are very engaged with the world, very engaged with creativity in the world. So my first question for you is, how do you keep things, how do you keep everything running? How do you keep things moving forward? Or, or do you on, yeah. all, on all those different tracks? <laughs> I often use the metaphor of spinning plates mm -hmm. in the air and having lots of plates spinning. Um, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I think things go into a kind of productive um, marination or even like a hibernation where it's still on my mind or it's still part of my creative consciousness, but it's not something that I'm actively focusing on in the moment. Uh, I do have a pretty powerful capacity for code switching, so I, I switch back and forth and um, I schedule myself uh, quite a lot, but I'm very energized by having a lot to do. Um, I've never been bored a day in my life. Mm -hmm. And so it's not tricky for me in terms of keeping all of the different things going and keep the engines running and that sort of stuff. Um, it can be a little bit challenging if, because I do so much collaboratively, to have sort of the channels all flashing back and forth. But um, I think that I also prioritize um, rest and I prioritize these sort of buffers that allow me to respond to what's inspiring me in the moment instead of having a completely blocked out schedule. Okay, great. You mentioned switching. You mm. said that, that's, I'm so glad that you brought that up. Yeah. Um, you said that's something that you feel that you're good at, switching gears, switching lanes. Uh, I can wear a lot of hats. And so that is like the switching of the roles and the moving in between those roles. I think that there's certain things that I can't do from one to the next very, yeah. very simply. Um, like a Latinate to a Latinate is very, very easy, but I would be have a hard time jumping into a complete different grammar structure. Yeah. Um, but sometimes too, my capacity in a certain way gets used up or I sort of run out of steam a little bit. For example, I teach yoga at the local 
arts organization. And um, when I was teaching a lot more classes, I had a hard time with other things that required me to teach or communicate effectively or um, activate in that way. So I have a kind of limited bandwidth in all of the different roles. Mm. And as long as I'm keeping my, my bandwidth under uh, my limits, yeah. which might be high depending upon what I'm talking about, yeah. then moving between them, yeah, no big deal. You know, before this I was meeting with contractors over at the arts organization. Before that, I was scheduling sessions with my collaborator later this week, and so. Yeah. I think it's really important for people to know how they work, yeah. like how their brain works. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know personally, I am, I'm a little, sounds like I might be a little different the way my, my brain works. It's hard for me to switch gears. Mm. Um, uh, I, I do better trying to, bulk all of the same activities um, in one chunk because um, it is it is hard for me to switch especially going from a right brain to a left brain or a left brain to a, a right brain but I know that and so I'm personally I'm able to plan things understanding that is that something that you eventually learned about yourself and you maybe were you not um, uh, maybe having some things not going as you would like because you didn't know how your brain worked and how your behavior mm, worked? That's a very good question. I don't think I remember exactly when I became aware of how well I worked. I know that um, that whole left-right brain thing doesn't seem to be a challenge for me to move back and forth. I do get hyper-focused on tasks when I'm in them. Mm. And so I really settle in. I'm really focused. Uh, if you really poke me, I'll be like, ah, you know, what, am, what are you doing? Like, yeah. let me finish what I was in the middle of. <laughs> Good to um, know. Yeah, don't interrupt me. <laughs> but uh, I'm not. I'm not sure when I found that out. But knowing that, I mean, that whole buffer thing that I actually just described—that's a pretty new invention. Mm -hmm. Because my incredibly high interest level in so many different projects sometimes pushes me to overbook. Mm -hmm. And so, really, only in the last couple of years have I had the opportunity to put a little bit of space around a certain project or give myself a little bit of. What, what I think is going to be a downtime, it ends up being very productive time because mm -hmm. it's just unfettered time. And that means that whatever's pulling me in that moment is really what I get attached to. And so if I have a whole week blocked off in my schedule, that ends up being a whole week in the studio, in the garden, talking to my collaborators. You know, it, it ends up being a lot, Good. So which you're, is wonderful. So you're a blocker. I guess, yeah. only for only for that, um, only for that buffer time. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, one of the big things that I believe it's a big part of what you uh, what you are up to, which is the artist residency. Mm -hmm. Tell me that that's something that even though I'm an artist, I'm I've never done an artist residency, mm -hmm. and I'm not and and uh, people I know have done them, mm -hmm. but I'm not really that familiar with what's that all about. T can you tell me about? artist residencies in general, yes. and tell me specifically about yours. Yes, that's a really wonderful question. I get that question a lot from family uh, and friends. Residencies for artists and writers and creative people are one of the best opportunities we have to develop collegiate networks and to uh, create possibilities for collaboration and acquaintances uh, for professional skill building, but also for um, creating and finding opportunities. So after graduate school, I began applying to arts residencies. Um, and I also already had the inkling that I would be interested in running one. Part of that came from the fact that when I used to live in San Francisco, um, my partner and I were both artists. We had been renting this lovely studio with a group of other artists in the Mission District of San Francisco. And then we got booted out of the way to make room for um, tech offices, which are no longer there. Okay. Um, and so th this whole displacement, which happens to uh, artists and people of color and, and you know, anyone that can be deemed like a less uh, valuable real estate asset, uh, was really, really hard and really frustrating for us. And we remember coming home really mad one night uh, after our new two hour commute to our new art studio and thinking we would never do this. You know, we would never displace artists. What if, you know, it just made us think, what if we had space that we could share with other artists? Um, so that was many, many years ago at this point, but um, 
after graduate school, which I finished in 2018, I began applying to residencies. I attended one at the Vermont Studio Center before, which is up in Johnson, when this is before I actually moved to Vermont. And that was a really, really wonderful experience with an incredibly big cohort of talented people. Mm. And that really gave me the cue in that this idea about running a residency was a good one. It is a fruitful and beautiful experience to be gifted the time and space to simply focus on what you are interested in doing as an artist and be surrounded by others who are also given that time and space. So when you did that residency in Vermont, how would you describe how did things advance for you or how did you grow from beginning to end? Hmm. How, like, um, how would you describe that growth? Well, I went with a project in mind that I wanted to work on or accomplish and I got distracted by something else. So I worked on other artwork, on other work. Um, but I made numerous connections with artists uh, who are around the world, an international cohort of people. Uh, many of whom I'm still in contact with, who I'm actively either collaborating with or planning to collaborate with. Um, we keep in touch with each other. We send each other opportunities. Um, we call upon each other when we find ourselves in those necks of the woods. Um, so, I mean, to me, really, the biggest thing was the community. Uh, I think I was also preparing for a really big solo exhibition in Philadelphia at the Fleischer Art Memorial. and just having four weeks where I was able to focus on finishing or even just beginning some of the series that I ended up exhibiting there was such a gift. Uh, I didn't have to cook my own meals. I didn't have to mm. worry about uh, t walking the dog. You know, mm. I was just there going to the studio 12 hours a day. Um, and whether or not an artist or an, an arts professional or creative has gone to higher education in the arts, you you do sort of crave that time where you can really just focus on the thing that's inspiring you. Yeah. Were so. you? Would you say that you're pro, uh, pulling out the making your own meals part of it, but um, you know, just being around other creative people was that helpful as opposed to just having more time by yourself in your studio? Both of those things. I think that they're equally important. I mean, for me, I'm a I'm an extrovert, so I know that, and I get very excited uh, by being around other creative folks. I just came back from a residency in the Arctic Circle, uh, the Arctic Circle residency in Svalbard, and I was with 30 other really incredibly talented and interesting people for two whole weeks and no one else. So your entire society becomes shifted over into a creative state of mind, into observation and response and it's During that residency, what was the medium that you were w working in? Observation. I went there with plenty of things to do uh, calligraphic notes, watercolors, uh, drawing. I did a little bit of all of those things. I mostly went into a sponge modality and simply witnessed and had conversations uh, with the land, with the water, with the space, but also with the other artists who were there, many of whom had a much more directed hands-on project for mm -hmm. the time on the boat. So this, oh, so this was on a boat. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that was a fairly remarkable residency, um, which I had applied to years ago and had looked forward to ever since beginning, the, before the pandemic. And so that was a really interesting thing that was kind of a career milestone that I made for myself while I was still in graduate school. Yay. Yeah, Ex recommend. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. But that's that actually reminds me that you didn't just ask me about generally residencies. It's also the one that I am making. And mm -hmm. so the one that we are starting uh, up in Saxon, just outside of Saxons River in situ polyculture commons is meant to be time and space to work creatively, but also a commitment to creative community. And then there's this third tenet, which a lot of arts residencies don't necessarily focus on. For us, it's also really deep context of place, uh, bringing in a sense of ecology and environmentalism and seeding creative practice in a place that's related to that. So what was the second one? The, second, the, the, fir the first part was um, you know, giving time for people. Time, for, yeah. creative community. Cre yeah, creative community. Like, that tell was me, the second one. Yeah, yeah, tell me about that. Um, well, just as I was describing in my own residency opportunities that I've had, 
uh, bringing people together who are able to focus on creative process and be artists and writers and respond creatively to the world, that's a gift. Uh, a lot of artists think really uniquely or differently um, from, I, I don't know, the general, the general populace. It's, mm -hmm. it's our gift to society is to be able to be visionaries or to have a unique angle on something or to interpret things through color or sound or words. Um, and so in creative community, you're not the only person doing that. Mm. You're surrounded by other artists who are also doing that. And so that is sometimes time to work in the studio side by side, but sometimes it's actually coming together for a workshop, an opportunity to learn something side by side. When you, you did a, um, an advanced degree in, in uh, was it? Painting and printmaking. Print. What was, did you have an undergrad in a creative yeah, I did my bachelor's degree in fine arts uh, painting with a minor in art history at Tyler School of Art. Okay, so you've been in this art, art and being around artists. And I knew I was going to go to art school from three years old. Really? I was ready. Did yeah. you grow up in an urban area or did you grow up no, in a rural? No, uh, rural, very, very rural uh, Pennsylvania, northeast Pennsylvania. Oh. Um, it is actually a metro area to the new to the New York area. Uh, a lot of people do a commute over to New York and Newark from okay. there. Uh, but it is rather rural. It's it's yeah. So were trees. you were you the artsy girl in class? Absolutely. Artsy kid? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the artsy girl, sometimes the the ta talented one, sometimes the outcast as it goes, <laughs> depending yeah. on the age. Were you um, <laughs> artsy and just creating? an art class or were you a did you dress uniquely I think many that. people would have described me as dressing uniquely okay <laughs> maybe that is still true <laughs> but uh, mo mostly I just drew I drew all the time drew. and then I painted all yeah. the time and then I wrote poetry all the time mm. and these different processes became uh, stacked so they all I was very fluent in all of them and I would move back and forth yeah. and what's really interesting about then going into um, art school was the way that a lot of those things fell off and I had to focus on just one for a while yeah. and now that I'm in my 30s and I'm really engaged in my own creative practice I'm back into that kind of multiple multiple fluency yeah, yeah. where I'm moving in between I mean, and you see that in my studio work where I'm flexible between text, image, and abstraction. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of curious, when you were younger, did you have any issues where being this creative person um, disconnected you from other kids? And then when you got to art school, like now suddenly you found your tribe? Was it that type of situation? Um, probably. Yeah. I mean, there were definitely a few years when I was young, an adolescent, that I felt more the outcast, more I don't know how I belong in this. And it was challenging for me to equate the things I was interested in with the values that I was seeing enacted. Um, but I'm a, I've always been very confident and very effusive and uh, fairly social. And so despite that little gap in time when I was just being a teenager, yeah. <laughs> um, I think being in art school wasn't such a revelation. It yeah. was more like a coming into what I already knew to be true about yeah. myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of the things you had said earlier was that creative or arty art people, they kind of see the world differently and yeah, think, we about, do. think about things differently. And it's interesting because I am uh, realizing that, you know, personally, I'm realizing I very much was like that as a little kid. I was an artsy kid, super artsy. And then I fell in love with science mm -hmm. um, around fifth and sixth grade. So I kind of dropped the art because I was kind of getting me picked on a teeny bit, not majorly. Oh, that and, um, is so interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I kind of embraced the science thing. Mm -hmm. um, but what's interesting is I'm realizing that this kind of weird way that I view the world um, that was coming out in my art as a kid, like it never left me. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful now that I'm re-embracing re it mm -hmm. as an adult that um, you know, I do have an outlet for it and it feels very comfortable, but it's very exciting too because now I'm looking for new ways to um, extend and expand my creativity um, you know, so that I can kind of express what's going on up here. Sometimes I feel like what I'm putting on the canvas isn't necessarily as weird as I am inside. 
So <laughs> I think we talked about me getting into abstract art, but totally. yeah. Totally. Yeah. I, I really want to pick up on something that you said there, which was this sort of false choice between the sciences and the arts, right? Because when you see children, they're always very creative. And some of them have more of a logical or rational modality or they like things more orderly or mm -hmm. you have natural tendencies and that spans the gamut. Um, but it's not a real choice that we have to make either or. I think we have a lot of different faculties that can lend themselves to each other. And this whole concept of um, unsiloing disciplines and coming out of silos and isolation between disciplines is something I'm very, very interested in. Yeah, and also I think that there's a lot of ways that, because I was, uh, it, there's a lot of ways that someone who is creative and science-based there's a lot of paths for them, you know, especially with the way things work now, where you have creativity is combined with technology. There's plenty of, you know, opportunities for people to do all sorts of wonderful careers and wonderful jobs. Well, um, even the sciences, you know, being a scientist is being curious and then having a framework through which to test your curiosity and determine new knowledge and you continue from there. And so science as a creative process is something that I don't think it's highlighted enough. They're both very, very creative. Is there anything that you want to talk about for your, uh, anything that you want people to know about you, your art, your residency? Well, the residency uh, is under construction. Uh, we will be opening some public programming later this year, which is really exciting. Um, you can find out more about us on our website in situ polyculture.org okay we are a vermont nonprofit, and um as you sort of alluded to that is only one of my projects but it's the one that i have uh the most fire behind right now because it feels like such a important thing to do uh for the broader art community and also to support my own creative practice okay great yeah well cool well thank you so much for coming in and chatting with me. Yeah, thank you so much, Rick. You're very welcome. Such a pleasure. My name is Ricky McGeckrin, and you have been listening to Eager to Know, the podcast. If you haven't already, please go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join me next week for another Eager to Know podcast.